Needs no introduction, but out here in the West, there's a good chance, especially with your young age, that you've not heard of You will be done. It's not uh, just because of him, but it's because of the, the powerful way that he brings God's word. Uh, he is a very humble man, and he is a man that I look up to uh, very much. Uh, every time that I listen to Eric, I find that I'm a better person that I have more to give, that I have more to serve God with. And that's the whole point of preaching the gospel is to draw people closer to him. And so that's one thing I appreciate so much about Brother Eric, and he's going to be bringing that tonight. In addition to that, Eric is a former Marine. He also has been preaching since, uh, since um, uh, for 25 years. He is, serves currently as both an elder and the preacher for the Avondale, Georgia congregation. Uh, him and his wife, Vanessa, have three grown daughters, and we are certainly in for a treat tonight. Brother Eric, come to work. Yes, sir. It is a delight to be with you. We're thrilled to be here, thrilled that you're here. I hope you can hear me. I can't tell if you can, you cannot. Is it me? The light's green if that helps. I move this one. I feel like the phone commercial. Can you hear me now? Good. You want the podium? Turn this one off? No, leave it on. Working out well, isn't it? We're off and running here. <laughs> Excuse me. Young people, I want you to know that I appreciate your presence here this evening, and it is great to be with you. I am a huge fan of young people. I, I, I love you, and I don't even know you yet, but I appreciate you. Appreciate you. Appreciate uh, your parents who love you. Uh, sidebar before we get started, listen to your parents. That's real free, but real important. Listen to your parents. Nobody loves you more. Nobody's rooting for you more. Nobody cares about you more. Don't let the world fool you. Your parents love you. Your parents care about you. Your parents want what's best for you. They didn't ask me to say that tonight. I just about can't not say that when I see young people. I just want you to know that. Is that okay? Is that okay? Okay, five of y'all said okay. I'll find your parents and I'll tell them. All right, just kidding. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's our topic tonight. I read an article many years ago written to Apologetics Press. It was many years ago, and it was written by a college student. He wrote into uh, AP, and that's what he said. He was questioning his faith. He was beginning to doubt what the professors were telling him. And he said in that article, I don't want to be a fool. You should understand that somebody is. One of us is a fool. Either those who believe in God are fools or those who don't believe in God are fools. But there is no escaping it. Somebody is a fool. The verse in its entirety reads, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. That's Psalm 14.1. If the Bible is true, and I'm certain that it is, this verse is revealed by God through the Holy Spirit unto man. I want you to think about this for just a moment. In this verse, God is talking. God is talking about a person who denies he exists. Can you imagine for just a second doing that? Here you are standing and you're talking to someone and then somebody else says you don't exist while you're talking. God is saying there is an individual who says I don't exist. That's what God says. And then God describes that person as a fool. And so to begin with, I'd like to talk to you just briefly about Bible descriptions. The Bible describes people in a variety of ways, not just one way. It uses a lot of words to describe people, and it describes them differently. And if we believe that God is, then God has the ability to read hearts. And therefore, if God describes a person then we can trust that God's description of that person is correct. 1 Samuel 16, 7, 
The Lord said to Samuel, look not on his countenance nor on his height of his statue, because I have refused him. And then the Lord says, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And so you have these descriptions given by God of various people throughout the Bible. And what the Bible says is when God gives that description, it's because God can look at the heart of the individual he's describing. One of the descriptions is found in the book of Exodus, chapter 32 and verse number 7, where Moses sends the mount, and the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. This scene has God's reaction to what Israel is doing, ready to destroy them. And the reason he's ready to destroy them is because he says they are stiff-necked. The word stiff neck means severe or churlish, cruel, grievous, or hard, obstinate, or difficult. Let me ask you this. When you read Exodus 32 and God looks out and says they're stiff necked, would you want to be described as stiff necked? You go a little further in the Bible, and Psalm 10, the Bible describes people as being wicked. The verses say something like this, beginning in verse number two. The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in their devices. They have imagined for the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire. He blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. The word wicked, the word wicked, Brown, Driver, and Briggs says it's criminal. One guilty of a crime or wicked, hostile to God. Here is God again describing someone as wicked, hostile, and criminal, in fact. Going further into the New Testament, Jesus describes some people as hypocrites. Matthew chapter 23, beginning in verse number 1. The Lord spake to the multitude and his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe and do, but do not after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves would not move them with one of their fingers. Thayer says of a hypocrite, it's an actor, a stage player, a pretender. The Lord continued his speech about the Pharisees and he says they say and do not. They do their deeds to be seen of men. They make long prayers for pretense. They rob widows' houses. They love the chief seats in the synagogues to be lavish with titles befitting their greatness. They shut up the kingdom from heaven so that others cannot enter, and they themselves won't enter. They clean the outward, but the inward is full of dead men's bones. Let me ask you this. Having heard that, you want to be described as a hypocrite. But there is a description more telling than all of these. And that is our description tonight. Those who believe the Bible must believe that God knew the words he used. He could have said any things to describe people, but he chose stiff-necked. He chose wicked in another place. He chose hypocrite. And then he came to the person who denies his existence. God didn't say wicked. God did not say hypocrite. God said fool. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. No matter what this individual says, the Bible says he is a fool. And I would urge you not to seek counsel from fools. Strong's defines the word fool as, these are not my words, just for the record. Strong says stupid, wicked, especially impious, a vile person. Brown driving and Briggs says, foolish, senseless, fool. Dictionary.com says, a fool, a silly or stupid person, a person who lacks judgment or sense. Again, I would submit to you, someone is going to be a fool. For God cannot both exist and not exist. And God takes the position that those who deny his existence are fools. Why would God designate someone a fool? Consider, first of all, that the person and what they are saying. The person says there is no God. Immediately when you say that, it has implications. 
In fact, I would urge young person or young people, please consider this, that when you come to the origins, you come to the subject of God, whether he is or is not, please understand you come to a fork in the road. And then these, this road parts into two directions, and these two directions will never again meet. If you take the word that says there is a God, you will never have harmony with this side of the road. You take the road that says there is no God, there is no way that road will ever join with that one. In fact, these two positions are so diametrically opposed to each other, somebody has to be a fool in the end. Here is a person, when you say God, there is no God, the reason among others that God would say this person is a fool, because immediately you are left to explain your existence on this naturalistic, atheistic, materialistic road. You must travel that road forever now, and you have to explain you on the road. How did you get here? Just what is the best explanation that the learned have come up with traveling this road? They may disagree in some details, but the, the, the conclusion and the explanation for their existence without God is that life came from spontaneous generation. That's the answer. Has that been disproven? Absolutely so. Lewis Pasteur and others and their, their experiments have proved that life comes from life and that of the same kind. We know that to be true. You can have that on this road, but you can't have that over here. And so you have to believe it just happened. It came from nothing. After you sidestep the insurmountable hurdle, then you have to figure out how, now that you've come up with this, how did a soup of chemicals figure out a way to make copies of itself? After making more and more copies, these cells then changed into other things. These new things became more and more complex until they eventually turned into a fish. Given enough time, this fish who lived in water shed its scales and gills for wings and became birds. These birds eventually shed their wings and became mammals. These mammals became more and more complex till they became primates. Given more time, the primates eventually became human. While this was going on near or about the same time, the same thing was being done to produce a female so that they could mate and then produce other offspring. Now this story or one like it with maybe some other details is the best those who deny God's existence has come up with. This story is contrary to every single thing we know to be true from science. Why is this person foolish? Not only is the story foolish, but the story can't even begin until we get life here from spontaneous generation, which we know is impossible. The story is like a baseball player trying to run home from second base, but Actually, he struck out at home plate. It's foolish to talk of single cells making copies when you have no cells to begin with. John tells us life doesn't come from spontaneous generation, but life comes from life. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, without him was not anything made that was made. John says this, in him was life. Where does life come from? It was in him because it's eternal. John says that which we have seen, which we heard, we've looked upon. Eternal life. That's the explanation for how we got here. Not spontaneous generation. Why would God call someone a fool? Because when you deny God's existence, you have a very impossible time explaining your own existence. Why call them a fool? Because it's foolish to believe in epic, random chances creating the world. Those who believe God look at the world and see intelligent design behind it. When one denies God's existence, he is left to the whims of nature to explain everything. The solar system's existence and position has to be explained by random chances. The position of the sun, the earth's tilt on its axis, the moon's relationship to the earth, the tides, the galaxies, all accidentally found their way into existence. All of this occurred before our single cell soup started simmering. Of all the planets, Earth just happened 
It just happened to have the right atmosphere to sustain our life. Our lungs just happened to evolve precisely to take in oxygen, use it in our red blood cells. This just randomly happened to have the right conditions. Our bodies happened to have happily evolved to use it. There just happened to be a sufficient amount of water to sustain life, and we just happened to evolve to need water to sustain life. Of course, God, the very one whose existence is denied, he would say it this way, I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hand, stretched out the heavens. All the hosts have I commanded. For thus said the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he had established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. Isaiah 45, 12 and 18. It's little wonder then that God, God would call such a man a fool. For every house is built by some man, but he who built all things is God. Well, now that might true be, be true of the house you live in, but it's not true of the atmosphere, it's not true of the galaxy, it's not true of earth. That just happened. It's foolish to deny intelligence. Obviously, if there is no God, there is no divine intelligence. But I submit to you fr this, friends. These individuals who deny God's intelligence, they also deny your intelligence. They deny human intelligence. Try to imagine an intelligent human being denying the existence of human intelligence. Once you reject God, this is the foolish position you must take, and they do. Does the existence of the computer manifest the intelligence of his designer? Does a wristwatch ex existence show the design and intelligence of its maker? How then can the humans who thought about, planned, tried, failed, tried again, and who eventually succeeded in making the items, well, now they don't manifest any intelligence. I was asked to come and preach, uh, teach at a school, Christian school, elementary school, uh, fifth and, uh, six and seven-year-old children, and we were talking about creation week. And I took with me a, a laptop computer, uh, an iPod, and a cell phone. And I, I, I was talking to the children, and I asked them, now, I want you to understand that this computer actually is the result of a small explosion. You see, what happened was there was a little metal workshop, and then a bomb went off inside, and after it exploded, all of the metal pieces that were in there put themselves together, and after the explosion... He pulled out a computer. And the little children looked at me and said, mm -mm. Mm -mm. Tried an iPod. I said, you know, this is actually how the iPod. And they said, no. I tried it with a camera and a phone. And they said, no. And you know, the humans who made the computer say they used the human brain as a model and how they did that. And the ones who made the camera said they used the human eye to make the camera and the lens and so forth. Now, the ones who, so you're talking about the eye being used to make a camera. Well, the camera is intelligent and shows design, but the eye, well, now that's just a random series of chance events that just sort of happened to evolve. Isn't that obvious? All that there is more to us than simple electrical charges firing in our brains? How can it be possible that the humans don't think and that we're no more than the gray matters in our mind? I read many years ago, and it's worthy of asking you, will you think about your thoughts? Can you? Can you think about your brain? Because if you could think about your brain, wouldn't that be something outside of your brain? Does my pausing to think about what I'm going to say next demonstrate evidence of a thinking person? Am I presently choosing my words? Do I have the freedom of choice and the ability to think? Or are all of these efforts simply the electrical charges firing back and forth within my brain? Let me ask you this. When atheists write lengthy books denying the existence of God, do they intend for those books to be read? And their arguments and their thought about and then understood? If one is a believer in God before he reads an atheistic book, is it the author of the book's hope 
that the reader will learn something new. And then with that new information, think differently than he did before reading the book. And if that is the case, after he thinks about it, is it his hope that he'll change his mind and become a non-believer? Because if the atheist who writes the book isn't thinking, he's writing a book so that people who can't think will read his book. To what end? Why does a man who can't think write books to try to convince people who can't think about someone who does not exist? You know, nobody ever debates Santa Claus. You ever seen the propositions written up? I affirm that there's a Santa Claus. And then somebody says, I deny it categorically. And we're going to debate it. Nobody ever debates the Easter Bunny. Why not? They don't exist. Why are they spending so much time? If it is the case that nature is all there is, our brains are simply the gray matter in there, maybe you could figure this one out. How did nature work out in one man's brain not to believe God and work out in another man's brain to believe in God? How did nature do that? Do things exist beyond the material? Is there such a thing as love? Hate, joy, mercy, forgiveness. If love doesn't exist, when atheists want to express their devotion to their husbands or wives, what do they say? I, you, what do they say? Do atheists tell their children, I love you? What about hate? Do atheists hate theists? Do atheists love theists? Well, if they don't. Love doesn't exist, well then they don't hate us because hate doesn't exist. But, but then it brings us to this question, are they indifferent toward us? But if they are indifferent, why do they spend their life trying to convince theists that they're wrong? You'd be a greater waste of time than to have the one life that you have lived on an empty, purposeless, meaningless pursuit on something that doesn't matter in the end at all. Friends, that's the result and consequence of denying God's existence. No wonder God calls such a person who chooses that path a fool. But then it's also foolish to deny objective morality. William Provane saw the conclusion of his evolutionary and atheistic belief. And, and I read this. Wow. Well, this is wrong. It's two left shoes. But he at least had the conviction of his positions and he was willing to articulate it. And, and I want to read to you what he said. Now, he was actually in a debate. For what, I don't ultimately know. But he was in a debate, and he said the following. It's sort of lengthy, so please bear with me. I'll try to get through it, and, and we'll talk about it briefly. He said, quote, first, the argument from design failed. There is no intelligent design in the natural world. When mammals die, they are really and truly dead. No ultimate foundations for ethics exist. No ultimate meaning in life exists. And free will is merely a human myth. These are all conclusions to which Darwin came quite clearly. Modern evolutionary biology not only supports Darwin's belief in evolution by descent and his belief in natural selection, but all the implications that Darwin saw in evolution have been strongly supported by modern evolutionary biology. He continued, when you die, you're not going to be surprised because you're going to be completely dead. Now, he said, if I find myself aware after I'm dead, I'm going to be really surprised. But at least I'm going to go to hell, where I won't have to hear all those grinning preachers from Sunday morning listening. Let me summarize, still quoting. Let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear. And these are basically Darwin's views. There are no gods, no purposes, and no goal-directed forces of any kind. There is no life after death. When I die, I am absolutely certain that I am going to be dead. That's the end of me. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning in life, and no free will for humans either. What idea? Christian human has a great deal, a great deal going for it. 
It's warm and kindly in many ways. That's the good part. The bad part is that you have to suspend your rational mind. That part is really nasty. Atheistic humanism has the advantage of fitting natural minds trying to understand the world, but the disadvantage of very little cultural heritage, and that's a real problem. So the question is, can atheistic humanism offer us very much? Sure. It can give you intellectual satisfaction. I'm a heck of a lot more intellectually satisfied now that I have to cling to, now that I don't have to cling to the fairy tale that I believed when I was a kid. Life may have no ultimate meaning, but I sure think it can have lots of proximate meaning, end quote. Mr. Provine's conclusions are true if organic evolution is true. Mr. Provine's conclusions are true if atheism is true. But if Darwin's theory is not true, and if atheism is not true, these are the conclusions of a foolish individual. Let's talk about some of the things that he said. Is there any intelligence design in nature? All I'd ask you to do is take a look around at nature and see. You have to find the materials here to evolve. Everybody talks about a big brain or explosion, a little bitty, and nobody talks about how we got the materials for the explosion. How does naturalism account for the existence of the materials in the first place? Because if ever there was nothing, there would still be nothing. The axiom is true, nothing from nothing leaves nothing. But something is here. And we can't gift you the material out of nothing and then listen to you tell us how it evolved from a single cell. The evidence is life comes life. Therefore, life must be eternal. Evolutionists need the materials to make the single cell that learned to copy a cell, and we can't give them to you. Mr. Provine then tells us there is no ultimate foundation for ethics. There is then no ob absolute objective right or wrong. I suggest to you again, look around and ask yourself, is that true? What if one group of humans decided it was right for them to systematically murder and annihilate another group of humans? No one outside of the aforementioned group, given Mr. Provine's position, could truly say they did anything wrong. And does anybody actually believe that? While that true, that's true for atheism and evolution, that doesn't mean it's true. Because on what basis, then, would anyone have the right to try, convict, and jail the leaders and guards and others in the Nazi regime. You do appreciate that in Germany, that was the law. In fact, that was the guards' common plea. I was obeying orders. I was obeying the law. So we have a situation where in one country, the actions of the individuals involved were legal. Well, given his position, how could the rest of the world band together, go into that country, get those people out, take them to a world court, and tell them they did something wrong? Was slavery in America wrong or right? Is there such a thing as human rights? Is it wrong or right to refer to humans as three-fifths human? It shouldn't be hard to answer whether or not it's objectively wrong to rape, traffic women, abuse children, enslave people, murder, commit adultery, lie, cheat, steal. You tell me, is that right or is that wrong? By saying anything is wrong, you're appealing to an objective, ultimate, moral standard. There's only one legitimate answer. Yes, there is an ultimate moral standard. There is right and wrong, and we all know it. We might say this, only a fool would say it wasn't. The standard is the very God whom the fool says does not exist. And to Israel, I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy. Why? For I am holy. The angels cry, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come, Revelation 4, 8. Reading through the New Testament and the Bible as a whole, it is God's perfect character that is the standard of morality. A man approached Jesus on one occasion, and he referred to Jesus in this way, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus said, 
Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. John says, God is light, in him is no darkness at all. Paul says, we live in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God cannot be tempted with evil, James says, neither does he tempt any man. According to the divine, there is no ultimate meaning in life, and free will is a myth. As I was reading through that material, I wondered, why did he have to say ultimate meaning? Why didn't he just say there's no meaning in life? He came up with something he called proximate meaning. So what you say there's something called proximate meaning, it may have no meaning at all to me. I wonder why he was debating it all. Why write? Why lecture? Why spend the very few moments on earth debating on something that in the end again doesn't matter? It seems a colossal waste of time for beings who are natural, who when they die are dust which return to dust. There is no heaven, there's no hell, there's no judgment, there's no accountability, no life after death. If that position is true, why would you waste your time giving it to the cause of trying to convince others? Why bother with that? In the end, they don't mean anything, you don't mean anything, and there is no meaning at all. And yet, they write and they write and they write and they lecture and they lecture and they lecture. It is quite amazing that if you want to take their position and you wanted to know, how would I live my life? What would be the reasonable, logical way to live my life if I believe that? Amazingly, the Bible will tell you that. The Bible will tell you. If there is no God, here's how you should live. It's found in 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 32, that great chapter on the resurrection. Paul says, if after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it me? If the dead rise not. You should read that as, if there's only the material. If there is nothing beyond the grave. If there's no eternal life. If the dead rise not, how should I live? Should I debate you? No. Should I waste my time writing books and books and books and seminars and doing this to try to convince you? No. What should I do? If the dead rise not, inspiration says, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. That's the way to live, but that's not how they live. I'm amazed that why would they take so much energy and effort and time on a purposeless, meaningless endeavor. If there is no life after death, the only conclusion that makes sense is there is no meaning in life, not even proximate meaning. Mr. Provine said, we don't have any free will. It is a myth. Now, was he programmed to say those words or did he choose those words over other words? Could he have said free will is one of the things that most distinguishes humans from animals? Could he have said that? Or did he have to say free will is a myth? And I wonder what he means by that. Do we not choose our words and our deeds? Can we not change our words? Should we not be held accountable for our actions since we're not choosing them? God told Adam and Eve the trees they could eat of and the trees that they couldn't eat of. He also told them that if they did that which he said they couldn't do, punish them. Was he wrong to do so? When Cain killed Abel, did he do anything wrong? Did he choose to do that? Out of her tribe, choose to entice Joseph? Was that her? Did he choose to reject her? Did she choose to lie about the incident? Did David choose to take another man's wife and should he have been held accountable for that? After all, free will is a myth. None of these people did any of these things. I ask you again, take a look around and see we know we can choose. Not only do we know we can choose, we know we must choose. We choose every single day. Does the atheist choose to debate? Does he choose the proposition he will affirm and deny? What if you sent him two propositions? Would he choose one over the other? Does he choose his arguments before he stands up to talk? Does he study and come to the conclusions and then choose the best ones to set forth while avoiding ones that might not seem to fit his case? Does he choose to show up to the debate place on time? Or does it all just happen apart 
from his free will. God did make us free. And the whole purpose of being free is so we could choose in part whether or not to love him. Paul in his great sermon in Acts chapter 17, he said among other things, God that made the world and all things that are therein. He says that God made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. And then Paul says that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him. You read Acts chapter 17, verse 24 down to verse 31, and you take that text and then you put it next to Mr. Provine's text. And what you will find is the apostle Paul and Mr. Provine disagreed on every, every point. Let me absolutely make this clear. One of them is a fool. Did God make the world or didn't he? Did he make all things that are there or didn't he? Did he make you and one blood of all nations or didn't he? Paul says he did this that they might seek the Lord. Paul even goes so far as to refer to us as God's offspring. It's easy for atheists and evolutionists, naturalists to go around saying that there is no free will and there is no meaning and so forth. Let me ask you, would you like to live in a world where people are not accountable for their actions? There was no accountability because you actually weren't making choices? Judges 17, verse number 6, Israel lived in such a world. The Bible says there was no king in Israel, and those, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. The idea of saying it is one thing, but if you and I had to live in it, it'd be something very different. I'm thankful the police believe that people have the freedom to choose, and then they hold them accountable. Many of you young people are in school. If you have the, um, if you can, and if you find a professor or somebody telling you, there's no free will, there's no meaning, there's nothing right, there's nothing wrong, if you can summon the strength, you might ask him, is it wrong to cheat in this class? I can't imagine why he would fail you. I can't imagine why he'd call you to attend you to the office. I can't imagine there being a problem because you actually aren't choosing. How could you hold you accountable? You didn't choose. Free will's a myth. And if you did cheat, actually, there is nothing absolutely wrong. And you thought it was the right thing to do for you, situational and autonomous. The idea that there is no ultimate ethical standard and having no freedom of choice, is a, this idea, friends, leads us to the position that God takes in Scripture. Only a fool would draw such conclusions. Not do we choose we have to choose friends one day we're going to give an account for these choices second corinthians 5 10 jesus or the apostle paul wrote for we must all appear before the judgment seat of christ everyone may receive the things done in his body whether they be good or bad the very point of having freedom of choice is that one day god's going to hold you accountable for the choices you made paul said he that doeth wrong shall do the wrong which he had done and there is no respect for persons colossians 3 25 God has given so much evidence for his existence that it is absolutely foolish to deny it. When you read through the Bible, what it sounds like we're reading is God telling us, calling to us, beseeching us to see him, to find him, to know him. He begins in chapter one of his book. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the creeping thing and over all the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And then the Bible says, so that we don't be confused. He blessed them and he said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God is the one telling us, you're not one of them. Exodus 4 and verse number 10, Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not able to hear the neither have I been able to speak, but thy servant is slow of speech and slow of tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or the deaf, or the seed, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? The proverb writer says, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the 
Lord made even both of them. Acts 14, some men tried to bow down to Paul. Paul says, sirs, why do you these things? We also are men of like passion preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which in heaven and earth, the sea and all that are therein, who in time past suffered all nations to walk in his own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good. He gave us rain from heaven, fruit seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Every house is built by some man, but he who built all things is God. Romans 1, beginning in verse 18, Paul says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and God had listened to it, so they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to, become, to be wise, they became fools. Friends, I have to tell you, as a gospel preacher and just as a Christian, I read this material, read this material, read this material, a myriad of emotions run through me as I read denial after the denial of the existence of God. And admittedly, sometimes I'm angry, sometimes I'm frustrated, sometimes I'm last. I just feel sadness and pity. When you look up to the heavens, the sun and the moon and the stars declare God's glory. When you look outward at the world, the earth, life, oceans, trees, animals declare the glory of God. The fish are in the water, the animals are on the land, the birds are in the air. Everything we need is on this planet, readily available and in abundance. And then when you look inward, you manifest the glory of God. I never once looked in the mirror and thought, wow, I'm so proud of my ape heritage. Humans come from humans. We have a conscience. We have the ability to choose and the freedom to exercise it. We have and we know we have an objective, moral, and ethical standard. We know it's wrong to abuse children. In fact, what's the nation upset about now? The Catholic priest scandal. The atheist would have to take the position. He didn't do anything wrong. Not objectively, not morally, and yet everybody knows it's wrong. A few years ago, it was a Penn State scandal. Everybody knew that's wrong. It's wrong to rape women. It's wrong to murder humans. We know it's wrong. But we also know it's right to love our spouses. It's right to love our children. It's right to help those in need. The evidence is abundant, and it's the same for everybody. We have a genetic code, but no intelligence writer of the code. We have laws in nature with no lawgiver. We have matter with no mind behind the matter, behind doing intelligent things. We have sin with no sinners. They deny the existence of a being who their very existence demands. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Maybe he doesn't know that God can read hearts. The proverb writer is still right. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. To quote God, they are without excuse. Thank you.